There was so much that I wanted to create and this was back in 2005 that I did not know the outlet of that. I did not know where to go, where to create, what to do. And I started talking to my peers and you know, I started asking them, hey, let's, let's do something, let's start a company, let's, let's build software. Uh, I mean, that IT was the only thing that we knew. And all I got to, all, all the replies I got was, oh, come on, man, college life, only four years, it will never come again, let's enjoy it, let's enjoy all our life in next four years. And I felt that, that why I, while I hear you, I think the concept looks flawed. I think when I heard my peers saying that, let's live all our life, let's do all the musty, all the fun, everything in these four years, I almost felt like that I'm going to die after four years. My logic was pretty simple. If somebody can pay me 10,000 rupees for what I've built, I'll multiply and make it 10 crores. That was the idea then. But I just wanted to figure out who is going to pay that 10,000 rupees for anything that I have built. For me, it was the most important thing that anything that I'm building is of value or not. Ownership, for me, is the only way of life. Is the only way that has given me all that I have. A lot of personal growth and a lot of impact, not only on my life, but the lives around me. And that ownership, the tenant of that ownership, is nothing but I get beaten when things don't go well. Work-life balance, one of the biggest debates, you know, of our times. I personally believe that there is no work-life balance. And I'll tell you why. Because if more than half of your life is what you call work, and you disassociated life from it, just by definition, you're screwed. You're not going to find that balance in this life for sure. Because there is no balance. There's nothing called balance. Hi all. Uh, you need to lower down your expectations because uh, I don't know how much of this is going to be insightful for you, but uh, we are going to talk about some truth. By the way, how were last almost two and a half days, if I can call it half already? Great. How many of you switched off your phones or did barely looked at your phones in last? Mm. And how's the life feeling? How many of you are feeling that, dude, bro, this is life, man. What the fuck are we doing? How many of you have had that conversation in the, in the corners? That this is life. This is how it should be. These are the people I want to talk to. These are the conversations that enrich life. How many of you have had this conversation? Wish I could do it forever. And then comes the bloody Monday. <laughs> how many of you? are dreading the Monday that's staring at you. Come on, be truthful. <clears throat> to all the people who raise their hands, and all the ones who raise their hands inside, <laughs> we need to talk. And this is why this conversation is important. Gautam said that this is about living life of personal growth and impact. But I can tell you that this is Gotham's version of this conversation. My version of this conversation is something that you will discover probably at the end, hopefully. I'm Ashish Tulsiang. I have been an entrepreneur since I remember. I wanted to start a company when I was in ninth class. My dad somehow talked me out of it. And he said, uh, just make sure that you get good grades in 10th and then rest is settled, OK? Quite a bargain, two years. I can do that. And then 11th and 12th, started preparing for engineering, came into engineering, realized within first two months that this is just a bigger school, uh, which I really was trying to get rid of for a while, and got disenchanted. So my first company started because there was a lot of energy of creation. I really wanted to create a lot, and I did not have the problem called, I, I want to be my own boss. 
I, I didn't have a boss, but, but there was so much that I wanted to create and this was back in 2005 that I did not know the outlet of that. I did not know where to go, where to create, what to do. And I started talking to my peers and you know, I started asking them, hey, let's, let's do something, let's start a company, let's, let's build software. Uh, I mean, that IT was the only thing that we knew. And all I got to, all, all the replies I got was, oh, come on, man, college life, only four years, it will never come again, let's enjoy it, let's enjoy all our life in next four years. And I felt that, that why I, while I hear you, I think the concept looks flawed. I think when I heard my peers saying that, let's live all our life, let's do all the musty, all the fun, everything in these four years, I almost felt like that I'm going to die after four years. <laughs> because everybody looked like they were preparing for death. And there was no better life after this death. Everybody felt like they wanted to live full. And here I was, and I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I'm doing something wrong, but maybe, you know, I cannot, I cannot stop here. Got really disenchanted by, you know, the peers I had, you know, in my college, but then I started looking for people like me outside. And guess what? I find few. Uh, the ones I found were the ones, you know, who I started building with. I started looking for people who are interested in what I'm building. And my logic was pretty simple. If somebody can pay me 10,000 rupees for what I've built, I'll multiply and make it 10 crores. That was the idea then. But I just wanted to figure out who is going to pay that 10,000 rupees for anything that I have built. For me, it was the most important thing that anything that I'm building is of value or not. 10,000 rupees was just the placeholder for that value. Only if I knew that this path is going to be so brutal. I was uh, listening to NVIDIA's CEO. You know what's NVIDIA? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a tech company, a chip manufacturer. Uh, you know, have always been on top of their game, have had, you know, their own crest and troughs. But recently, with AI, they have, you know, again come up as, you know, with a breakthrough. And the company is going like, hundreds of billions of dollars right now. And, you know, somebody asked their founder, CEO, who's still at the, you know, hem of things. They asked him that, uh, you know, if we make you 30 years younger, this was started 30 years back, if we make you 30 years younger, what do you think the young Huang is going to do differently? And he smiled and he said, I am definitely not doing this shit again. And the interview was surprised. I mean, you're talking to somebody who's at top of their game in the tech world, that too in the hardware chip, like the hardest thing. This is not like a 21 year old who built an app and it went viral and boom, he's a billionaire. This guy is slogged to make hundreds of billions. And he said, well, if I know, if I knew what I know today, that how difficult, how brutal, how emotionally challenging this journey is gonna be, what will it take? How much endurance will it take to get here or to just get through? I will definitely not do this. I did this because I didn't know. But don't get me wrong. He also said that even today, what gets me going is that every day I fool myself asking the same question. How hard it can be? I have to fool myself every day that maybe, you know, I think this is going to get easier from now. And that is not the story of entrepreneurship. In the last 15, 16 years of building companies, what I've learned is that it's the story of ownership. 15 years back, if you had asked me, I would have told you that, hey, entrepreneurs are everything. You need to have your own business, working for somebody else. Uh, and all, all that crap that you read on internet, you know, cliched stuff, you don't want to work for somebody else, work on building your own dream, otherwise somebody will recruit you, build there, da, 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 da. And as Gautam mentioned, I got blessed with some of the teammates, you know, 40% of my company, we run a very small team, it's 140 people, not a very, very large 
company, but out of those 140 people, 50 plus people are seven years old with an 11 year old company. Our management team, you know, most of our three layers are as old as the company. They breathe it, they are the ones who built it, they are the ones who have their DNA, uh, you know, in it. Now, who built whom is anybody's guess. But what I've learned is that ownership is where it all starts. All the Steve Jobs quotes, they look very, very cool. All the entrepreneurs, they look cool when they talk about, hey, we built this and that. But the problem is that while I'm speaking to you, if hell breaks loose somewhere, I'm the one who gets beaten. What is ownership? All of us, we signed up to be here. 300 of you are already above most of the population in India today. You know why? Because you took that first step to say, hey, you know what, is there more to life? Because this is not a job fair, this is not upskilling, this is not going to give you any direct ROI, and yet you took out five days from your life, spent not only the ticket, stay, travel, and whatnot. And the fact that you are here in the room is why I'm speaking to you, because I know that you wanted more. What we are going to learn here, what we have learned in the last two days, and what we are going to learn more, is going to be a very, very powerful vocabulary. This is not feeling like my energy. I'm not vibing with this. Uh, we start, we go back to the world where people who don't have this vocabulary, we all start bullying them. We get a new vocabulary to run away from things, if at all, we work. And deep inside we know what are we working on, what are we running away from, what are we trying to avoid. Here, the vocabulary that is available to all of you, to all of us, swings both ways. Whether it's the vocabulary of ownership, or whether it's the vocabulary of avoidance. Ownership, for me, is the only way of life. Is the only way that has given me all that I have. A lot of personal growth and a lot of impact, not only on my life, but the lives around me. And that ownership, the tenant of that ownership, is nothing but I get beaten when things don't go well. That may not be true, but I take that to the heart. When I'm doing that job, I'm employed by my own company. Customer is my boss, technically. When I do that job, when I take up a customer assignment, when I hire an employee, when I promise a career to someone, when I make a promise to pay someone, when I make a promise to deliver something, when I make a promise to Gotham to deliver something here, uh, yes, you guys, you, you can beat me uh, in case. But how your work, how your life, how your relationships, how your promise, how everything occurs to you is going to have an irreversible impact on your life. You can't get away with that. Whenever you fail, you don't get sad. You actually feel sad when you fail without trying. Close your eyes and think about it. Whenever in life, we all fail every day. I fail more often than I would even appreciate. But whenever we fail, we don't feel sad every time. There are certain times where we feel ki, and somebody will come and say ki, dude, you know, you played well. Like, yeah, I mean, we lost. You're still fucking smiling. The guy is confused. Why are you smiling? Because you lost. But because in your bones, you feel that we played really hard. This was awesome. I learned a lot. I stretched that last muscle in my body. But yet, you failed. Why are we happy in that moment is the question, is an inquiry that we need to make today. This is a question that I ask myself almost all the time because we keep failing, because we keep hydrating. And whenever I have seen anybody in my team, anybody in life, a vendor, a customer, a partner, a participant, you know, an organizing team, whenever we ha I have seen anybody fail and they lacked ownership, that has made me sad.
because I figured that 20,000 things can go wrong. Air condition can go wrong, camera can go wrong, mic can go off, anything can happen. But we all are sitting here because there is a lot of ownership that this team carries. There is a lot of ownership which your companies, your own company, you yourself as an individual carry. And that is exactly what reflects when you pitch to a customer, when you pitch for a job, when you pitch to your manager when you even pitch to your family for that matter. I've always heard this thing when, when people are asking their parents about permission. Go up a planet. Abba ni manenge. Actually, Abba has no problem. Problem is they don't trust you. And they don't trust you because have you seen yourself acting. The way you act, Abba is definitely not going to let you go on your own. And Abba has no interest in going to Goa. And this inquiry, this realization, this self-awareness is extremely important. I have talked my parents to let me do things where actually when I look back, what I did with that, I have actually legit asked them that were you high? <laughs> like, why did you allow me to do that? And they were looking like, why are you asking today? And like, because when I look back, I could have died. <laughs> like, you never told us that. I said, how the fuck will I tell you that? But I realized that why did they allow me? Because before I went ahead and asked them that permission, before I told them that it's going to be awesome, all my friends are going, before I gave them weak arguments, I actually told them that, you know what, what worse can happen? I figured that there is going to be, you know, you can get mugged, uh, you know, there are people who can rob you, uh, there, is, there is this, there is three potential downsides, threats, problems that I can fall in. And by the way, I have already taken care of all of them uh, this, this, this way. Uh, if you allow me, it'll be great. I will make sure that not only these downsides are protected, but I am going to make sure that I am absolutely fine and I will be informing you three times a day. And they had no comeback. They were like, well, okay, not three times a day, just call us once, once a day and we are, we are good. When we work in our companies, when we work with our customers, same thing. We want them to trust us like we want our parents to trust us. But we don't want to take the burden of ownership. And one magic that I have experienced in my life, one magic that I have seen has worked everywhere for anyone that I see is at the top of their game, is very, very high ownership. If the video assignment here, uh, Gurin, I'm not calling you out, but uh, if somebody was pitching, if I was pitching for a video assignment here, and Siddhant and Gautam had asked me that, who are you? What have you done? I said, this is my first assignment, I'm, but I have state of art camera, I've done this and that. I think one pitch that I will definitely give them is that, you know what? I'm going to charge my fee, but I'm also going to write a check back to you. I'm going to cash your check and come over and do this. But in case I fail, in case you don't feel good enough, you cash my check. And friends, this is just not a story, this is not a challenge. This is how I landed my first deal in life. Because this was 2005. Startups were not cool. Young people were not starting companies. Average age of people I was dealing with was 55. I was running a telecom company, I was trying to actually bootstrap a telecom company. People who I was talking to, you know how I used to go in the meetings? A sexy watch, suit, tie, gelled hair, and what not. And then to sometimes, and most of the times actually, somebody used to say, how old are you? I was like, dude, fuck. How does he know? Because I was trying to desperately look 10 years older. 
desperately, at least then. That was my view of why will they trust me. But I was trying to continuously gather that trust and credibility because I knew that whether I succeed or not, whether my product succeeds or not, is a separate issue. We will deal with that later. My problem is who is going to give me the opportunity? And how can they give me the opportunity? And the only way for that opportunity to come in was to show so much ownership, to own so much of that, that I'm ready to lose and I'm ready to take the brunt of it. But with all this, as I said, the new vocabulary, you know, I've, I've started experiencing people when I ask them, hey, so what are your plans? He said, oh, you know, we are going to do this and that and I'm going to achieve this and I, I have this goal and, you know, I have this beautiful life and I attended this seminar which said, you know, beautiful design of life and this and that. I'm like, okay, what are you doing about it? He said, I'm manifesting it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Surprise! Manifestation works when we work. Only manifestation doesn't work. And this is more important than anything else. Just thinking about a goal, just creating that beautiful picture, the picture in which everything is superlative, view, the house, the car, the family, your social stature, everything is absolutely at the top. But then what do we have? Monday blues. All of us are dreading the Monday that is going to build a life. It is one of the biggest epidemic of current day. We are consuming so much information. Action is the hardest problem to have. And else, what we are going to get is anxiety. <coughs> I have a small exercise for you. Do we have uh, pen and diaries? All of you? I have a small exercise. In next 60 seconds, write down, create two columns. Okay? In one column, write down five desires, five goals, desires, dreams, anything that you call them. Write down five of them in next 60 seconds that you already know that you want to achieve. You're not thinking them now. That's why 60 seconds. Five desires, dreams, goals, that you already know that you want to do, you want to achieve next year, two years from now, three years from now. This is not a time to improvise. This is the time to actually just write what comes to your mind immediately. Those are the real desires. Goals, desires, dreams, no matter how distant, how close, but five things that you want to achieve badly. You feel that, you know, I really want to do this. I want to be that. Are we good? Leave your pens. How many of you wrote all five? Oh, wow. How many of us were not able to write more than three? How many wrote only one? Congratulations. There's a second part of this exercise. In the other column, in front of each goal, desire, dream. Write the action that you're already taking 
and if not write an a an action that you're already taking you're not going to take but as of today you're already taking that action in your life to achieve each of those Fifteen seconds. All right. I don't. I have the urge to ask you how many N is. But I'm not going to ask you that. I want you to live with it. I want you to live with your manifestation. That is kinda not working for you. Mike's breath work is only effective in breathing. You still have to go and work. That's what I realized after meeting Mike. One day Mike told me, Ashish, his insight blew my head. He's like, Ashish, you know what? Breathing is important. like genius <laughs> He's like no 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 I'm telling you you know how is my like He's like no I'm telling you people actually forget breathing I'm like what do you mean man He said there are times during the work day during you know during any problems during in general in life you know you actually stop breathing I'm like okay wow that's an insight and he said just become aware and start breathing and i start becoming aware and i realize how many times i stop breathing how many times so much is stored in the gut it didn't change my life now when i'm in trouble apart from what the fuck i also have another thought breathe that's all that's all because after breathing i'm again like what the fuck how do we solve this <laughs> so in my head i was like screw you mike but you didn't tell me what to do after that but but probably that's that's what mike does thank you mike <laughs> what's the problem what exactly is the problem that we are dealing with today to achieve these goals to get these ns out work life balance how many of you believe in work life balance this is exactly what work life balance looks like <laughs> the top is the work and the small at the bottom is life i ignore the ladies work life balance one of the biggest debates you know of our times i personally believe that there is no work life balance and i'll tell you why because if more than half of your life is what you call work and you disassociated life from it just by definition you're screwed you're not going to find that balance in this life for sure because there is no balance there's nothing called balance because imagine all of us sitting here if this entire gang who's making this event happen if they start saying no no it's weekend <laughs> i don't work on weekends i switch off my phone on weekends this is me time we all are screwed we'll be running into each other like where do we need to go what next work life balance i think is a popular internet scam it is a scam of content creators it is a scam it is a scam by people who don't have their privilege in check it is a scam where people just want to pander to soft people oh my god my weekend got screwed you know why 
So one engineer on my team, we are, we are into software, right? So software also gets something called bugs. So once, uh, and we are in the restaurant space. So we, we make software products for the restaurant industry. We power some 20,000 restaurants in 52 countries as of today. And this is not a flex. I'm just telling you my problem. My problem is that 20,000 restaurants and the software that I run is almost like an airline software. It cannot stop. There is no way. You cannot run a restaurant by saying, hey, the software stopped working. Orders are not going into the kitchen. I can't give you the bill. I can't process your payment. Everything is going to stop. We don't have an option. We don't have the opportunity to stop. So once uh, you know, a new developer joined our team, uh, very, very work-life balance friendly guy. <laughs> so uh, one day I heard that he was cribbing about something. I asked him, I said, dude, come. What happened? He said, no, it's okay. I said, no, no, come on, tell me. You're not my wife. <laughs> By the way, my wife does not do that, huh? I'm just saying. <laughs> Love you too, Sakshi. <laughs> so I said, uh, tell me, tell me what happened. He said, no, I mean, uh, I went to Kashmir with my family this weekend, uh, but Saturday morning I got this call. Something happened in, you know, a restaurant in Mexico, and uh, there was a bug, and I had to resolve it, and uh, you know, it almost ate up my entire Kashmir plan. My family was cursing me. I kept hearing, and I was like, okay. I said, uh, so would you like if we make sure? that when you're on you know, travel or when it's weekends, nobody calls you? Said, Absolutely, that'll be, that'll be great. I said, like, you want me to like, just make this a rule? I said, I mean, no, kabhi, kabhi. sometimes it'll be okay. And then, come on, dude, we can make it a rule. You tell me, I'm the boss. So he said, yeah, that'll be great. I said, okay, all right, I'm going to make this a rule. You need to make sure that whatever code you are writing, bug should not come on Saturday. <laughs> right? With work-life balance, there should be some code software balance, no? bug, bug code balance, right? And he was like, no, that I can't promise. I said, then fucking solve it. <laughs> and even if you're in Kashmir, please do that. Problem is not that he felt his Kashmir trip screwed. I also felt bad a little before he complained. After that, I didn't feel bad. <laughs> but I think the problem I had was that his sensitivity in that moment was not for that customer who pays us. And from that money, we pay him. His sensitivity was not about that restaurant's weekend going bad. His sensitivity was poor, that we were not coming through on our promise. We promised stars and moons to that customer, and they were feeling screwed. His sensitivity was not towards his teammates, who are holding on to that promise with both hands, and boom, suddenly it doesn't work. And I wanted to inquire, where is that sensitivity? Why is it lost today? I don't appreciate vendors who, when I complain, that, hey, you did not come through on this, they're like, I said, so what? Your fucking job, man. This is what you need to do. You are not supposed to tell me your problems. I have a very simple rule. The one who pays can complain. So if you don't pay me, you can't complain. Or you can complain, I'm not obliged to reply. Like, yeah, okay, okay. That sensitivity is where work-life balance debate has started appearing. What I'm calling out is entitlement. What I'm calling out, that internet scam of work-life balance is happening because entitlement, because all of us have started feeling that creeps into me as well. Life should be a certain way, people should be a certain way, people should behave a certain way, they should talk to me a certain way. Why? You're not a gift to the universe, and you will never be. Don't get ahead of yourself. Work-life balance is nothing. It's one life. And integrating that work as a part of your life 
is the only way. I fear concepts. Gotham on the opening day was talking about loneliness as one of the biggest epidemic of our times. I'll tell you why. I was in New York, one of the, I think after Tokyo, probably the second highest suicide rates amongst uh, high performing finance professionals. I was in New York and I was talking to a friend and then he invited me to a party. And the party was at somebody's house and you know, a lot of friends around, a lot of people around. I met all his friends, lovely people. And I kept on asking him, like, how do you know this guy? How do you know that one? Like, where is she from? Where is he from? And at the end of it, I asked that, oh, so none of these people work with you? Of course not. I said, what the fuck is of course? He said, you don't make friends with people you work with. I said, what? He's like, dude, why are you surprised? I said, I am, I may look surprised, but actually I'm disturbed. He said, why are you disturbed? I said, because I don't see you disturbed. <laughs> Yet. And he's like, why will I be disturbed? I said, give it time, but that's not the point. Point is that you are telling me that a place where you spend nine and a half hours a day, the entire week, your 12 waking hours in your head are about this place. That is almost half of your life. And if I take the sleep out, that is technically three-fourths of your life. And you are telling me that the people who you are sitting around, talking to, working with, who are supposed to build your life, who are supposed to support you, you are supposed to support them, these are the people you don't want to make friends with. You don't want to hang out with them, you don't want... You don't want any kind of personal relationship with them. You're calling it weird. He said, I mean, yeah, that's the rule in the city. And I said, that's why city is committing suicides. Because loneliness is not hitting you. You don't want to be high integrity. You don't want to be authentic. For me, for my life, a lot of people say entrepreneurship is a very lonely journey. I mean, yes, to some extent, in the decision-making, you feel yourself alone. You find yourself absolutely lonely. How many of us run our own businesses? A lot of us. How many of us want to run our own business, want to be our own boss? This is for you as well. It is lonely. It is lonely because decision-making is lonely. But trust me, I mean, I have made friends with people I work with. And one way you can think that the fucker is selfish. He wants people to work for him or with him using friendship. But trust me, even if that is true, all of us are having a good time. And that's very, very important. Me and Sakshi, when we started hiring for our company, we made a rule very, very early on. While in the interviews, when people are trying to impress us with their skill and their, you know, things they achieved and da da da, all in my head I'm thinking, oh, like, can I hang out with this guy? When I ask them, though, so what else do you do outside of work? I am just trying to figure out: is he drinking? What is he drinking? You know, where do they travel? Is it my destination? Are they solo travel types? I'm like. But making friends with people I work with was the biggest therapy that I could achieve. It required vulnerability, for sure. It required me to be open. It required me to be wrong in public. It required me to continuously accept my failure amongst them. It required me to be tough. It required me to look at them in the eye and confront, give them feedback. All was not a child's play. But it made us light, very, very light. Gautam and Siddhant, Didi is here. They have been to you know, our office. But if in, in our Delhi office, we have a terrace where we have shisha 
for the entire team every evening, 6 p.m. Uh, this is just a bonding agent because uh, alcohol is costly. <laughs> but, and, and, and I mean, come on, D Delhi, there's too much pollution. Anyway, your lungs are fucked, so. But when you come to our office, something that we really cherish and are very, very proud of and has been built by all the people together is that my family, my friends, anyone, business, outside of it, they come and hang out at our terrace. They come and meet us in the office. Even our teammates, their spouses, their friends are also welcome and they also hang out there. Because that's the place where we spend so many of our waking hours that if we are not going to embrace it fully, it's not gonna work. If we are not going to think of it as a place where we can live mentally, it's not gonna work. Work-life balance, is something that is going to screw you more in a normal day. The thought of it is gonna screw you more. My view of work-life balance is that there is one life I should be able to do all the things in a day. My personal engagements, my work, my customers, my employees, and they should have the same freedom because that's something that I need to build to help me. It's a very, very selfish interest. Once we were in a party, we throw some nice wild parties. So a mid-level manager, every now and then, you know, somebody who comes from 10, 15 years, regular corporate MNCs. So this guy, drunk at 2 a.m., comes to me in the party. Like, Ashish. <laughs> like I said, dude, thank you. He said, no, 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 I need to tell you. I mean, this is phenomenal. In last 12, 15 years, I haven't attended this kind of party like in an office space. Thank you. So no, no, no. I tell you, you do a lot. Thank you for doing that. I said, dude, come here. This is not a party for you. He said, what do you mean? I said, this is a party for me. He said, no, no, no you're just being humble. I said, no, I'm not being humble. See, the problem is simple. If you get bored, you'll change your job. If I get bored, this place gets fucked. So the only guy who you need to take care of is me. <laughs> this party is for me. I did it for myself. You enjoy. Don't thank me. <laughs> hustle culture. Another internet scam. Don't hustle, don't hustle. What should we do then? Yeah, I have a problem with this. Everybody's, did you hear? Anxiety is when you live too much in the future? Yes, no? Problem is not that. Anxiety does not happen when you live too much in the future. Anxiety happens when you live too much in the future, but don't move in the present. The dissonance is the problem. If you're moving in the present, you can live in the future. That's called ambition. That's called dream. That's the goal that all of you just wrote. But nobody wants to hustle. Hustle for what? Why do we need to hustle? What is hustle? To me, I think it's really about building a life that I said I want to. If I'm not hustling to achieve the goals that I wrote, do I even want them enough? And that inquiry today is important. A small exercise. Read what you wrote, all the five goals and desires and dreams, and strike off. Read each of them in your head and cut, strike off any one dream or two or three or four that you don't relate to enough to hustle extremely hard for it. Those are the superficial dreams. Those are the induced dreams. Those are the dreams that somebody sold you in a 500 rupees course online. Those are the, those are the dreams that don't belong to you. They look nice, they sound nice. They're good to have. You feel good when you imagine yourself in it. But if you're not hustling hard already for it, 
I don't think those are, you want them enough anyway. Why do you keep them as a burden? Why do you increase your anxiety? I give you 15 seconds to think about and strike. How many of us did strike some dreams out? Congratulations. Congratulations. Those are not the dreams that you want. If you cannot hustle hard for a dream that you say or a goal that you say it's yours, that's a superficiality. You're signing up a contract with your own anxiety. And because that dream was conceived by you, you're the one who's going to bear the load of it all the time. My problem with the hustle culture is that all that we celebrate today is Olympians, Bollywood stars, Hollywood stars, entrepreneurs at top of their game. All the argument killers are Steve Jobs and the Jeff Bezos of the world. Elon Musk is the moniker for, you know what, Dreams, literally out of the world dreams can be. But at the same time, we also look down upon hustle. Your relationship, you know what is manifestation to me? Your relationship with the goals that you have and the vocabulary that you carry is going to decide so much in your life that you just don't know. I see one thing common in all developing nations. The relationship with money is crude. In India, the largest chunk of population look down upon rich, rich people and say, hey, must have murdered someone. You don't make so much money without killing, no? Must have duped someone. Not possible. You know, I was, I was at the time of demonetization, I was sitting in a car uh, in an Uber and that driver basically said, Modi did perfect thing. I said, what did he do? He said, demonetization. In my head, I was like, wow, you know, I finally found somebody who's happy with it. I need to know more. So I asked the guy, I said, Bhaiya, I didn't understand. Can you tell me more, like, how is it beneficial? So he looked outside, you know, a big car. He said, I was like, okay, that's motivation, motivating, but... Uh, what else? What, what did you get out of it? He said, sir, we don't get anything out of it, no matter what, anyway. I am just happy that these people are screwed. <laughs> and the relationship with money being screwed, how many people you meet who say, I am not after money? When they explain what they do, I don't do it for money. What the fuck do you do it for then? Like, is there a butter happening that I don't know of? Not being aware, not being in control of your own pursuits is a problem. It's a facade. If you're not doing, I mean, when, when I'm interviewing someone and I'm talking about the most difficult conversation, salary, TTC, they're like, you know, I'm not in, not in it for money. I'm like, okay, let me discount your CTC by 50%. No, 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 no. I'm seeking 30% hike. Fuck. Get your, get hold of your shit, man. Like, you, if you want 30% hike, tell me you want 30% hike. Don't tell me I'm not in it for money. But the other one is offering more. And this, this is a scam which everybody runs. We run, we see that scam in our family. Money is a dirty conversation. Hustle is a dirty conversation. Oh, that guy is hustling a lot. Ah, his mental health will suffer. All right. So people who are sitting idle are doing great. <laughs> if having more time at your hand is the only medicine you need for mental health, then unemployed people must be like doing wonders. 
Nobody died of working, nobody died of hustling. It's the integration in your life and it's being aware of your goals all the time. Brutal honesty with them takes a lot. It's very confronting. But if you don't own it, you don't have a way anyway. Did you see Narayan Murthy just said two days back, 70 hours? Funnily, now people are raging 70 hours a week online against it instead of working. When Rahul on the day one asked you guys to show your, see your screen time only on Insta, I think that was the hint, no? The amount of time that is being spent online is also nothing but the dope. Problem is not mobile phones. Problem is that when in real life we don't get a lot of dope, when we don't create a lot of joy in what we do, it can be pro bono, it can be any craft, any skill, any art, anything that we call our own. If we don't do that enough in a day, and if we don't find joy in it, we get stuck in the loop of reels. But resting is also important. As I said, rest guilt-free. I can tell you that for me, in my life, one of the most important things is that I also rest guilt-free. I take days off, I take time off, and I don't call them, oh, this is life, oh, I had, you know, hashtags, much needed holiday. I'm like, what do you do the time? Why was this much needed? It's a holiday, it's beautiful, you're enjoying the view, but that much needed holiday, Oh man, I feel that that's nothing but guilt. And if you're carrying guilt, you can't carry ambition. One thing that has, you know, helped if you are, if you are integrating your life well, if you are continuously, you know, hustling to achieve what you set out for, you can have smaller goals, that is absolutely fine. You don't need to have the topmost goal. But one thing that is extremely underrated in all our life is playing long games. Delayed gratification is what I say. When I started 18 years back actually, so in 2005, somebody asked me, you know, a very successful entrepreneur, he asked me, he said, so Ashish, what's your plan? I said, start this company, uh, Exit for a billion dollar in the next three years. He looked at me and he was aghast because, you know, he was already excited talking to a young guy, you know, talking about starting up, you know, these are not the days of startups, so he's even more excited. He didn't want to demoralize me. He's like, okay, okay, that's cool. Uh, what's the plan B? He said, four years. How bad it can be, no? And he laughed and he said, okay, interesting. Let's stay in touch. And I was like, what a fucking asshole. The right line was, congratulations, great, I'm looking forward. Nothing. But that, if you ask me, was a journey which was nerve-wracking for me. My first company was an absolute nerve-wracking journey. I was the one who was running. I was the one who was doing everything. I was the one who had an artificial timeline. I was the one who just wanted to do, do anything and everything to make it happen. Because I created an artificial timeline, a wrong goal for me, and why I'm calling it wrong? Because I was not doing anything worth a billion anyway. I did not even know what to do with it. But I was just running with a superficial goal in head, saying that I am going to achieve it. How? Why? And when I started my next company, Restroworks, I think one thing that I decided on day one, very, very early, between me and Sakshi was that this is not going to be a short game. We are not going to do anything that does not compound over the next 10 years. We are going to take every decision from today that at least has a 10-year timeline on it. And these are difficult concepts to, you know, think about because 10 years is too long, very, very difficult. If somebody had asked me in 2012 when we were starting RestroWorks that, hey, where will you be in 10 years? 
Trust me, my answer was, I will be. And that's my only pursuit right now. I will be there. And if I am going to be there in 2022, trust me, I'll be good. The fact that I am alive 10 years from now, the fact that this company is alive 10 years from now, we might have done something good by then. And that was the core belief. But how it helped us? Because it was a 10 year long dream, because it was a 10 year long journey, we avoided every possible shortcut. What are the shortcuts in our, in our work, in our business, in our life, in our jobs, in our relationships? What are the shortcuts? Let's get that quick money. Let's not say no. Let's get, let's juice it out as much as possible. Let's kill that competition. Let's kill that coworker. Uh, let's disagree with the boss. Manager is a fucking asshole. Let's see what he or she will do without me. These are short games because you want your gratification right now. Even if you're fighting with someone, you want the revenge today. You want them to just fall in the pool while talking on phone. That's it. But you just want that right now. And that dope, that quick gratification is the biggest poison. Because we start playing so short games, games become so short, loops become so short, that gratification comes this quick, and the shit also quick comes this quick. The good news about long games is that you can think so far out that even the shit takes time to come to you. It allowed me to think about my customers very differently. It allowed me to say, hey, you know what? We may be promising wrong to this customer today, but it is only going to happen for a year. This customer is going to move next year anyway. I want to hold this customer for next 10 years. What do I do now? So, okay, let's, let's be authentic. We went back to the customer, said, hey, you know what? We screwed up. We promised you X, Y, Z. We don't have it. But we are building it. Mummy Gazam. You stay with us. Here's your money. You keep the money. You keep using the product. Allow us to build this. We will come back. If we deliver, we'll take the money. Or if you want to get, you know, if you want to change, go to a competitor, we'll also help you migrate. This one thing not only got us some of the most permanent customers forever. We have a lot of customers who are 10, 11, 7, 8 years old with us who actually built us. It created a lot of authenticity in the system. We could talk to our team and ask them these questions that, will it, how will it play out five years from now? I said, no, no, we'll be screwed in five years. I said, don't do that. To all the professionals here, to all the people who are running their own show of any kind, whether you are an independent professional, whether you're running a small team, whether you're running a, running a large company, if you want to see whether you played long game so far or not, come rule. By year three of whatever you are doing, if the referrals are already not making 60% of your business, you definitely have screwed up in a short game somewhere, either in delivery or the promise no matter what you do. And by year seven, if there is not more business, more inquiries, more work that is coming your way, then you can handle, definitely need to see where all the problems are. That delayed gratification is everything. Keeps your anxiety at bay, you can run longer in relationships, you can also wait for people to get screwed. When people, you know, you know what is my revenge? I'll watch. Because I know that if somebody has done something fundamentally wrong, they are going to do more bad to themselves than I can do to them. My ability to destruct them today is far less than their own ability to destruct themselves in the long run. So I just allow them.
And that has allowed me to be calm, to not worry, to breathe, and to say, hey, you know what? We'll, say, we'll see this five years from now. One anecdote, I, you know, I spend half of my time in the US, uh, but we started business in US a couple years back of 11 years of this company's existence. And in the US, we are trying to fry the largest fish. So when you're talking to Burger Kings and the McDonald's of the world and the CIOs, you know, I'm taking them out, you know, playing golf. They're playing good golf, but I'm not getting anything out of it yet. So I was talking to the CIO, and I could clearly see that, you know, when we started organizing these, you know, meetups, et cetera, I realized that there was a little bit of tension in the room, right? Because, you know, we, we are spending $100,000 to get, you know, 20 people in the room, putting them in a five-star, seven-star treatment, golf course, this and that. And, you know, I felt that I need to diffuse the tension, because the fact is that I am playing the long game. But they don't know. Who will tell them? What if they think that I want something out of them today? So I opened a conversation with everyone saying, hey, we started our company in 2012. This is 2022. This was last year. And I said, the fact that we have, we were there in 2012 and we are there in 2022, I want to tell you all that our target of building business in US is 2025 and 2026. We are here three years early. Our targets to sell will start from 2025. So today, in this room, we are here to know each other, play golf, relax, and chill. Nobody is going to sell anything to you. We just want to speak to you as a human and not a CIO. And we opened the party. They have taken that seriously. Nobody is still becoming a customer, but <laughs> it's not 2025 yet. So we are hopeful. Long games are, are the only games that you feel, that, you, that I feel, you know, will make you succeed in the short term, mid term, and hopefully long term. My last submission on this, the role of mentors. <clears throat> Do you know that Sachin Tendulkar, or rather Indian cricket team, has coaches? You hear, right? Yes or no? Do you really think that Sachin needs coaching? Come on. Okay. I think these are just coaches in the audience, huh? Do you really think Sachin needs coaching? Yes. Do you think Dhoni needs coaching? Yes. Okay. I'll play along. Yes. We will, we will do some business development for you. The problem is that experts need advice all the time. But noobs are always sure. The gully cricket champion does not need a coach. But people on top of their game Always need a coach. Shahrukh Khan is carrying 13 of them. Mentors are extremely, extremely important because what I have experienced is that, you know, advice from a random stranger, even your friend who don't have, you know, the right context or maybe biased is very different. See, the problem is, for me, what is the role of mentors? The problem is that I have grown, grown up a certain way. I have my own biases. I have, you know, my own view of the world. And my lens is red colored. World looks red to me. My biases. I look at the world like that. Then I go to my friend and ask him or her some advice because I'm stuck. And they give me some, they, they give me some very, very good advice. But the problem is that their lens is green because that's how they grew up, because those are their biases. And they sincerely believe that their advice is going to work for me exactly the way they intended. But what happened actually here? My red glass got a 
green advice. World looks yellow. And now both of us are confused. Because I am saying, this guy's advice doesn't work. He is thinking that it did not work exactly the way I thought. Because I did not get the green advice. I got a yellow. He did not give me, he did not know that I have a red lens already. Mentors and coaches are the only ones who have the power to take the red out and give you green. Now, whether it will work for you or not is a separate problem. But at least now, you got a new perspective. You got a new way to look at the world. You got a new way to think. Probably things look different through a green lens. Probably world is not as red already. But how to choose mentors? How to look for mentors? How many of you have ever thought of hiring a coach for anything, any part of life? And how many of you felt nervous if the coach is good enough or not? How do I know? I'll share a personal story. I was a, I was a good academic scorer. I was a good kid. Uh, not, as, not as studious. I used to do all other stuff as well. But, but grades were one thing that were kind of okay for me. So once a friend of mine who was not doing too well in his own math and science, he basically said, oh, I'm, I'm going to join a coaching center nearby. And I had never take tuition, uh, taken tuitions before. So I said, oh, wow, what's happening there? He said, you know, there's this you know, coaching center. My mom discovered I'm going there for math and science classes. You want to come along? I said, oh, will they allow me? So said, oh, it's a trial class. So anybody can come. I said, Perfect. I went there. So, and I was really happy because <laughs> I went in, I gave all the answers. Uh, you know, the teacher at the coaching center was like, all right, we, we, we got a student who does not need, you know, to... To learn a lot and maybe you know those are the people they so this guy really you know made me the hero in the class I was really I was like okay though I was not thinking about coaching but this can do good for my um, you know ego so I went and told my dad I said hey you know I, today I went to this coaching center sounded interesting da 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 my dad was like do you need math coaching I said no but it 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 was it was good it was good practice I I can I can do it he said perfect then join I said okay. Four days from then, my dad asked me, hey, so did you join those classes? I said, yeah, I'm still like, he said, oh, but, but you did not take money yet. I said, well, uh, they're doing a trial class right now. So my dad's reaction was, he said, wow, they try students before getting them in. I was like, no. The dad said, whose trial then? I said, I am taking a trial class. My dad was like, oh, wow. So you know more than the teacher? I said, no. So the who will take whose trial? I said, fair point, but my dad said, see, listen, whether you want to join those classes or not is your choice. You are not taking any teacher's trial. Take this money, submit, or get the fuck out. Don't tell me that you're taking a trial class. And that became the way of life for me. That kind of became a way of life where when I submit, I submit fully. The only way to get a mentor's help, the only way to help yourself is to submit. Mike said on the day one, I receive and I accept when I'm in gratitude, when I'm fully submitted. And I resonated with that the most. If you're thinking about a coach, if you're thinking about a mentor, go submit, go submit fully. That is the only way for them to help you. Whether you can use that help or not is going to be another battle which you have to fight. But first allow them to come in. Giving back, how many of us, you know, already in the last two days have figured how many people need their help 
with the craft that they have. The ones who did not find that, for me, what has worked in life is a long game of giving. You might have heard that if you do something well, don't sell it for free. But give it away for free. When you're selling, don't just sell yourself cheap. But when you're giving, that is the only possible way for you to compound your life. The world is watching you. The world is continuously watching you. All the people here who met you, they are judging you. We all are judging each other. Good judgment, bad judgment doesn't matter. We are judging who you are, what your craft must be, how do you speak, are you negative, are you cribbing, are you positive, are you enthusiastic, are you really invested in what you do, are you really passionate about what you say you are passionate about. And that is going to compound over years, because three years from now, you will run into someone here, and the other person will say, who? Uh, some random person met three years back. Or, they can say, hey, she, she is fabulous. She does very, very cool stuff. We could not stay in touch, but, you know, I saw her, you know, she, she showed me stuff, or she, the way she talked about it, the way he talked about it was great. The largest part of your opportunities are stuck in your network, not because people are not ready to help you. They're stuck in your network because people are watching you because your reputation is compounding, because your actions are compounding. World is anyway compounding that for you. Might as well do good with it. My, you know in every office, there are groups who can get into gossiping. Everywhere, entrepreneurs also gossip, and they gossip even more, like, really, really nasty. There was this group of four people and, uh, you know, I called them, I got to know that there's something growing. So I called, I called one of them, and I asked him, I said, hey, I have a very, very important project, an extremely important project. I want to give that project to you. You can choose a four-people team, anybody in the office, pick your team. And, uh, but, the, but the condition is, if you succeed, in a 90 day, a quarter long, three month project, salary double. But if you fail, you're out. You wanna take it, leave it, your choice. But if you don't succeed, you're out. May sound unfair, but that's a project because there's a double upside as well. The guy said, sure. I said, tell me four names who you're gonna pick from a certain team. The guy wrote four names, went. I called the next guy, the next guy, the next. I called all four of them, gave them exactly the same condition. You know what was most astonishing and not so astonishing about this? All the four did not write each other's names. True story. Two of them are still with us. They did not write each other's names. Then I called all four of them. And I showed them the names that they wrote. By the way, there's another funny thing. There were at least three names which were common in all four. These were the top high performers in the team. These were the people who were blinders on, absolutely reliable. And I called four of them and I showed them their names. I'll tell you, I told them that you know why your careers will get screwed. I am not gonna do anything to your career. What can I do to your career? Your careers are going to get screwed because the people who you are gossiping with, people who you are, you know, doing all the crap with, people who you are telling, you know, I bunged it, you know, I let it go, I did this and that, and then you are doing high five. They're watching you. They are going to go places in life. They are going to get presented with opportunities which probably will be worth for you, but you are not going to get that call. 10 years from now, these people will be asked, hey, do you know somebody who can do this and we have an opportunity? And they'll be like, mm, no, not in my network. Because my network is all, high five, I fucked him, okay. 
Everybody is watching you. Every day. Your family is watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. Your friends are watching you. And all I can tell you is that I carry immense gratitude. Immense gratitude. To all the people who brought a lot of opportunities to my life. If I sum up my life so far, and I say this in absolute humility and gratitude, the amount of opportunities on a per day basis that I receive in messages, in calls, somebody just wants to work with me, somebody is trying to help me, somebody is trying to just pay back, somebody is just trying to you know, pay it forward, has actually made me lighter in life, has made me feel that I need to give back more. Because the only way I figured life is by giving. I have figured this weird math that when I, whenever I give a lot, somehow I keep getting a lot. And to all of you, my last submission today is that there is this room full of 300 possibilities. Each of you can introduce yourself to each other, saying, oh, hi, we, uh, we do the human resources and we, do the, we dent the universe in this way and that way, and you can jargonize what you do. I can also tell you, we, we build software that brings bottom line efficiency to the restaurant assembly line, da, 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 da. How, what, how will it make sense? My introduction generally is we make software for restaurants. If you know any restaurant, let me know if, if they want it. My only tip to all of you today will be, we have one more day to go. When you introduce yourself to each other, in your introduction, have three things always. One, give the simplest, unsexiest view of what you do. Don't say we are a human resource. Say we do recruitment. Say I'm a recruiter. Why do you want me to interpret? Say I'm a coach, but a coach of what? Just say that. Like the simplest thing that I can remember about you. Two, tell them what is it that you can offer to them. How can you help them? Ask them what are they here for? And three, the most important, Ask them what they do and immediately think about if you can connect them to someone or if they need help from your network. Some of these people will try to give you back just because they got something from you. To all of you, I know that the fact that you came here, the fact that you sat through so many sessions over the last two days and continuing to do so. I know that you got this. But I would love to see all of you in coming years, year on year in LPS as a milestone, playing your long games, compounding your life the way you envisioned and striking off those goals for good. Thank you. <laughs> one of the reasons he's one of my uh, greatest mentors that I always look to is that there's, you know, when I, when I talk about the premise of elevating friends, one of the things that happens is he always tells the truth. And it's, it's hard to receive the truth if you, if you feel that the other person has anything but love or they lack integrity. But he, he is so much in his integrity and only comes from a place of love that the harshest truth <coughs> become very palatable. And then we can, you know, look into the mirror very, very beautifully. So that's the role he plays in every space he goes for. You know, so it's, it's an honor to have you on the stage, Ashish. It's been truly, truly a pleasure. Um, ah. so thank, you for, thank you for allowing me to do this. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, guys, what we'll do is I'll, I want to open 
uh, the space for some questions and know that, yeah, I, I like, we'll do at least, maybe, at least five questions, I think we, we can cover easily. But yeah, uh, this is the space to ask questions. Raise your hands, we'll bring the mic to you. Anything about life you can throw. Just see the magic that comes here. Okay, so raise your hands and we'll, we'll have the mic runners come to you, stand up, uh, you know, somebody will come to you, say your name, and then we continue the conversation. Thank you. Hello, hello. Am, am I audible? Hey, hi. Hello, uh, I am Pooja, and Hi, my question is, like you mentioned, um, and the sessions that we had yesterday also, the vision that I am carrying for myself is a long-term game, and I'm trying to embody that. I'm walking the path and taking the steps which is required, uh, but I don't know whether it is a block or something else, but when I go and meet, this is a bunch of people who are into evolution and transformation. But when I go out, the kind of people that I'm meeting, I won't say I'm not even finding that one person, person where I can be truly authentic. I try that, but somehow I feel that I am pushing away because being authentic uh, to my vision and myself, people somehow leave. So that's the one area which I'm like dabbling back and forth, back yeah, and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question, Pooja. Uh, Pooja, what's your mother tongue? Hindi. Hindi. Next time when you want to be authentic with people, do it in Hindi. I do it. Tell me authentic Hindi. Now, I will Good one. Um, Pooja, the problem is, we have a, as I said, these kind of places, hmm. we gather a lot of vocabulary. A be in integrity, yeah. you're not being authentic. Yeah. So when startup founders pitch me, you know, at times they'll pitch their startup and you know, tech people, they jargonize every shit. So they'll be like, we are doing this crypto and we are doing this, that, 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 and, and I, you know, I'll be like, dude, how do I pass through the labyrinth of, you know, deceit or stupidity, whichever. So I generally tell them, okay, abhi ye pitch Hindi mein de. Uh, anybody here who's not good with Hindi? Okay, just tell people beside you to translate. I Hindi, I authentic I'm still waiting. Authentic not Exactly the point. The question, the question in Hindi, so the answer in Hindi? My point is that you don't, these are not the people, this is a bubble. This is an absolute bubble. These are the people who are not going to sound authentic outside of this bubble also, by the way. In me se kisi ke, in me se kisi ke khud ke, khud ke workplace pe mil loge na, to lagega ki ye, to same admi nahi. Iska love kang ya. So, you have to understand that it's not that you are pushing people away. Probably, probably, it's an assumption. Uh, if I'm wrong, bear with it. Uh, you are not being authentic with them. You want them to behave your way. You're feeling superior to them. They're commoners. Don't even know the meaning of authentic. Do you know about breath work? <laughs> Have you met Mike? <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Be, if you're really authentic, if this place should do something to you, is this, that you can ask a question Safe space is not the responsibility of people around you. Trust me. Safe space is here. Either you feel safe or you don't. If you don't feel safe, nobody in this world can help you feel safe. Ah, you can get into some bubbles, but those bubbles don't retain over a weekend. Now what do you do? So when you go out and if you feel that you acting a certain way is pushing people away instead of attracting them to you, probably you need to stop, you need to think about, is there a change in vocabulary? Are you really being authentic? 
Are you trying to tell them something so that they can respond a certain way and then they are like, what are you saying? Uh, world is not going to work your way. Awareness should make you humble. Awareness should help you feel the other party better. Awareness should not be about that, hey, I now know myself better. No. Awareness should mean that I now know why are you not responding this way? And let me change how I say it. Let me change my conduct. I want you to trust me. Let me put some trust on table first. I want you to open your cards. I'll open my cards first. The only analogy that I feel, and, and I, you know, I always carry them in conflicts, negotiations of all types and kinds, it doesn't matter. Whether, it's, whether I'm negotiating with my mom and dad, my you know, neighbor, or, or, or in business, is that to most of the world, we all look like we are carrying a gun. Like, I'm talking to you, you haven't said this. So, the other party has only two options. Either they carry a shield, so you're like, your guards are up. Like, you're fucking, you're carrying a bazooka. How, how am I going to put my guards down? Or, if the other party is aggressive, then they also carry a gun, and they're like, da, 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 da. you're like, where did that come from? He said, you're also carrying a gun, no? I fired. I'm better than you. First step is to put your gun and your guards down. Sometimes you'll get fired. But people will say, sorry. Trust me. And if nothing else, you will come out better from that conversation. You know why? Because you will realize you did not get killed today. And anything that doesn't kill you just makes you stronger. So start reflecting on your own conversation. Start reflecting on your own vocabulary. World is, you are not entitled. World owes nothing to you. If people are getting like, you know, you are shooing away, shooing them away without figuring out why, you need to figure it out yourself. It's you, definitely not them. And these are not the bubbles where you will thrive the most. These are the bubbles only to tell you that given in the right circumstances, almost everybody can be loved. This is the only thing that you should learn from here. Most of the people are here assholes to other people in their world, including me. It's, it's basically in what relationship you are talking to me. I look very good right now. Work with me and then see. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can use that mic. Hi, I enjoyed listening to you. Uh, my name is Raghav Fernandez. Um, so the question I have is, you know, we all have that voice in our head that tells us um, not to meditate, for example, when we know we have to, to order that burger when we know it's not the best thing in the world for us, to not go for that evening walk when we know we have to. So any tool to kind of push past that voice and follow through? Hmm. Yeah, so remember Gotham's opening? So I tell you a story. I came to LPS in November of 21. I was 97 kgs. I am 97 today. Not, <laughs> not everyone loses weight, man. Not everyone loses weight in LPS. Like, live with it. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know the right answer to your, your question. What I can ask you reverse is that why do you want to meditate? Why don't you want to order that burger? Why do you want to go to that evening walk? You know, this question has a problem in itself, because these sound like tasks, right? And I don't do well with tasks, I can tell you. I'm, a, I'm an absolute rebel uh, in my head. Sometimes I'm a rebel without a cause as well. Like, I have to sit, but if you say here, then I'm like, no, I have to And I know that it is stupid. You know, at times it, is, it just gets too much, right? So, uh, figure out what's the goal. 
I think if you have the temptation to order that burger, while something in your head is saying that I should not, I think there is a dissonance in the goal versus, like what do you want to achieve versus what do you really think you should achieve? You want to have a great body, but for what? Like I feel like if you give Salman Khan as much money, there will be 10 apps. I don't know, there will be no Right? My goal is not, and I'm not looking down upon people with apps, but I'm just saying that doesn't work for me. Is it a good thing? I don't know. Is it a bad thing? For sure not. I'm, I'm very happy, and I'm not trying to create any superficial goal. If you feel that you need to meditate, for what? There is definitely the end result missing, is what I'm saying. Meditation is not the goal. Meditation is the vehicle to the goal. Is goal appearing to you good enough? And then you'll shift the vehicles. But if vehicle becomes the goal, then it's a problem. It's a new problem. Don't make vehicles the goal. Gym jana goal nahi ho sakta. Meditate karna goal nahi ho sakta. Mental peace, more focus. And more focus also in an abstract form is stupid. Like, what will I do with it? Once, you know, a Kavi ne ek joke suna hai, usne bola bhai, Haryana mein aadmi itna khali hai, ki ek baar ek tau ne, ab ye Kavi Haryana bhi tha, I don't have anything against Haryana people. Aaj kal maalum hai chalta. So he said ki ek baar ek tau ne rikshah wale se poochha, ki haan bhai, rikshah wala khali hai. Usne bola, ji janab, bola aap hir ludo khele. Kyunki jana tau ko bhi kahi nahi hai, aur rikshah wale ko bhi kahi nahi hai. So you basically are trying to use rickshaw without a destination. And if your destination is real, if you really want to achieve that, you may achieve that with meditation, with breath work, with a coach, with just, you know, you know, doing what you do well. For example, for me, meditation in silence doesn't work. And I mean, it's just me and I'm not fighting it at all. I'll tell you what works for me. I'm a creator, as in not the not the digital creator, huh? I'm a real creator. I create things. You know, for me, yeah, that. Uh, creator ko bhi explain karna wada. So, I, I, I love creating products. I love solving problems. I love uh, when I'm in that zone of thinking. And that's meditation for me. So what I do is, in my own company, in my own work, I pick up problems and I jam on them. And I'm, when I'm in the zone of jamming, like I can go five hours and I can get like some of the best solutions out. At least feels good, very, very. Rest of the times, I work with other entrepreneurs and I listen to their problems and talk to them. Because advice is not easy So for me, that works actually better. I feel extremely calm. I feel centered, you know, after creating a solution, delivering a solution, talking to someone, helping them. I you know, gather a lot of energy from there. So figure out the path to your goal. If meditation or walk doesn't work, if, you know, that burger, a bite makes you feel happy, do it, but then figure out what's the other path to the goal. Thank you. Hi, Ashish. Here, hi. Sorry. Hi. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, not a Too question, highly. but appreciation. I think this was by far one of the best sessions I have attended on leadership. Thank you so much. Uh, I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Hi, Anish. My name is Sapna. Ashish. She's looking at Pichai Wala ki, tu ne mereko galat bataya. I thought you were Ashish. I am telling you, these people are assholes. <laughs> so I thought you were Ashish and then he said you were Anish. Yeah, he is an asshole, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Ashish, uh, my name is Sapna. And when you were telling me about the story in New York when, you know, you were meeting somebody and he'd called very different people, nobody from his thing. I made a mental note and I told myself, yes, that's the right thing to do. I think this is the story about not chilling with your people because... <laughs> <laughs> so, and I turned to him and said, what a great point, right? Good insight. And then you said, chill with your own people. And I was like, ayo, now what to do? 
Like this is the problem. Like you're asking us to embrace all the troubles and mistakes and irritations. So no, no, no. I'm not asking you to do that. <laughs> no, you are chilling with your people, and then I can also see how the team here uh, also is so bonded. Correct. And like when I feel I'm chilling with my team after work, I'm looking at them and saying, "You need feedback. You need to up your game. Your proposal was shit." Correct. And I want to like I don't know what other conversations to have. But I do appreciate what you're saying that you know treat them like family. You know there Can has to be love. Can you take some feedback on this? Yes, please go. Will you be uh, that's able why to? I'm asking. Okay. Be be gentle. <laughs> I can see where you're going. So yeah. No, so so I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So so I'm going to give you feedback anyway. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but if you feel offended, don't tell me. I'll meet you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> breath work <laughs> breathe breathe <laughs> i sapna you said right sapna sapna yeah. sapna i think i think uh, if you are if you have these thoughts while chilling with your team and because you are saying your team i'm assuming that you're talking about your subordinates people who are you know either reporting to you or are beside you right you're not talking about people you know probably above you in hierarchy are you No, I, I run a small company, so it's oh, perfect, us, yeah. awesome. In that case, I will say that you don't respect them. That's the truth of the matter. You don't need to. Don't get me wrong. This is not, you know, preachy. That oh, everybody is a yeah, pure soul and uh, you know, God and all of that. No, no, no. People are stupid, and that's okay. Right? <laughs> My point is that the minimum hygiene of hanging out with someone. is to first respect them that's why i said i said a lot of other things as well i said i hire and when i make that decision i'm like can i hang out with this person if not skills are cheap i can buy them that's okay but they're all my friends they're all your they're all my friends we know i mean yeah. have you asked them <laughs> <laughs> the so that's another part right <laughs> so in your in your relationship i think authenticity is not when i say narendra modi is my friend <laughs> narendra modi also has to confirm <laughs> when <laughs> when when you are not having fun when you are not having fun in a in an equation trust me the other party is not having fun as well when you are fighting with someone they may look like an asshole but trust me never ask them how do you look because you won't be able to take it being aware of that is important do you want to live with it or not is your choice that is fair i am not saying please go and hang out with your team and have these negative emotions continuously saying ki mm, you don't do this well hey aaj hasa raha hai kal kaam kisi ke no my question that. was how I, do you have conversations with love and authenticity that don't, is the question don't 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 do conversations with love mm. you need to confront i also said that that you need to have those conversations which are real which are authentic you need to give feedback in time you need to appreciate them in public but you need to give them continuous feedback in person and you need to look them in the eye and say you know what i also screwed up but right now we are talking about you so explain why how will you fix it can i trust you again or not and the relationship hanging out sapna is actually not the job hanging out with your colleagues hanging out with your team is a by product when when people talk to me about culture in companies right you know when you when you see culture videos online what do you see people partying and doing high five that is that office no it's not parties happen as a by product of a good culture good culture is does not happen because there are parties you can only party when you are comfortable in your own skin and them as well so building that relationship right is important don't hang out with them first try and look at are you not giving them enough feedback because why is this chatter in your head and that's not only a feedback if you take it it's actionable any unresolved issue is actually the chatter in your head if you had if if you tell me all that you want to tell me once and for all next time when i'm sitting with you you have nothing else to tell me if i'm screwing up again and you tell me again 
you don't have anything to tell me more. Relationship with your team, relationship with your friends, if built on the right tenants, go a long way. For example, and this, you know, hopefully it will register with some of you. You know, you know Stockholm Syndrome? So, so many people at workplace, you know, in vendors, outside, in the associations, they become friends because they have a common enemy. That friendship is about bitching. That friendship is about dissing. That friendship is continually about, yeah, there go BT there, there go BT there. You know what happens with all of them? Once they leave jobs, they're never in touch. These two. The one who was the oppressor, they are doing well. But these two don't remain in touch. You know why? Because the friendship had a tenant which was a common oppressor. These people actually later on realize that they don't like each other or maybe don't have anything in common and they don't have anything to talk. Only friendships which are built on the tenets of you know, longevity, which is knowing each other, admiring each other, respecting each other, while fully knowing the flaws. When those relationships are formed, they go above and beyond. They go beyond jobs, beyond customer contracts, beyond, you know, beyond your fame. You need to really figure out. It's a good inquiry. Thank you for asking this question. Thank you for even thinking about this. Because it's a good inquiry you need to have within yourself that why am I having this chatter about these people? But trust me, don't hang out with them till the time you have that chatter. Don't hang out with the people who you have this chatter about. Do something about it. If you can't, don't hang out with them. It will actually create more, you know, it'll make you more anxious, negative, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll not create positive energy for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one last question. Uh, somebody from here. Okay, go. You're going to choose. Who do you like more? No, no, no. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. One last question. <coughs> Sorry. There you go. Namaste, sir. Namaste. I'm from Pune. My name is Deepak Mohite. You said to write 5 points. They were already ready, sir. And after that, you said to write what you are doing next. What are you doing in it? So, that touched me a lot. Because in 5 points, I had already written 4 points. I had to read 1,000 books, so I had to read 21 pages a day. I mean, I had to read 4 pages today. Here and there. But one or two points, I had to think about it, sir. That पांच सौ रुपये ऑनलाइन कोर्स रियली सॉरी कोई तो मैं उसपे बहुत सोचना चाहूँगा और अभी मैं उसमें चेंजेस करूँगा उसके लिए थैंक यू थैंक यू सर रियली थैंक यू और वो लॉन्ग टर्म गोल टेन एक्स सब मेरे दिमाग में आ गया सर थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू विल विल जस्ट टेक वन मोर क्वेश्चन � just planted people from planted people. Hi Ashish. So my name is Manmeet. And I think in my career I have reached a point of stagnation. And I'm thinking about, you know, doing something more and changing fields. And then again, there are a lot of voices, a lot of options in my head. So what is it that I can do to have more clarity? As in what is it that I should pick? Because it's going to be a lot of investment, a lot of effort, a lot of hustle. And I'm afraid that I might end up making the wrong choice. So would you have anything to suggest? Amit, uh, what do you do? So currently I'm a teacher. Uh, so I teach French. And my freelance business is that I do conference interpretations. So, I mean, in foreign language teaching, you stagnate really quickly because, you know, you don't teach beyond a certain level. And there's only so many people who want to learn French. Most of them then fly off to Canada with their PRs. And <laughs> you have nothing, nobody else to teach to. So, and... Then, you know, the other visible options are, of course, you go into university teaching, but then again, not So, Manmeet, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's the most, uh, you know, generic, but yet a little specific advice. But, you know, my, my view is, and this is my general view, you know, about almost every career, that uh, stagnation can mean two things. Uh, I'm just trying to qualify that for you. One, you're bored of what you're doing. You're like, this is done, no more French, this is it. If that is true, I don't know what to, what to say. Then I will say that, please, pick whatever works best for you. 
But if you are saying that, hey, my love for French is not lost, I still hone the craft very, very well, but I am not able to figure out you know, more opportunities within that arena. It's a second case, this one. Yeah, so my, my recommendation to you will be that make a list of top 10 people in your area who are at top of their game. Maybe the interpreters, maybe translators, maybe authors, maybe I don't know what else, you know, what, what are the career trajectories are, maybe a professor in a university. Make a list of those 10 people. Follow them on every possible social media if they are there. Read about them, you know, wherever you can find any material on them. You will find out a lot of things that they do which catapulted them into, into those opportunities. Skills are overrated. They are important, but they are overrated. Skills are available. If I need a French translator, I'll whistle and 100 will appear. Like if you want a software developer, 20,000 will appear. Problem is not that. Problem is that are you doing things that are going to put you in a place where opportunities will hit you. Right? Agar aapko universities mein opportunity chahiye, to aapko mujhe batana padega, how many vice chancellors are you meeting? How many people are you meeting? How many professors are you meeting? Are you doing online webinars? Are you sending out signals through your work to the universe enough that people can say, hey, you know what, this guy does this. What I talked about helping others. If you have such free time to figure out other opportunities, and if you are so talented that so many opportunities are coming to you and now you are confused, that ye ban jau, ya wo ban jau. Sounded like a problem of plenty. May not be, maybe. But if you have so much time, I would rather say that why don't you start translating, you know, some great texts in French? Why don't you start figuring out what is the world on the French side, English world or any other world, are looking for? If you go deep enough, I have never found any particular domain, any discipline, any business, any product category, any service category, any business for that matter, or any career, I've never found it not bottomless. I always find that depth in every career, in every opportunity is so, it is so deep that one person cannot achieve like even one percent of it. So unless you are done with French, my recommendation to you will be that stick to your guns, go deeper, figure out what are the areas you have not conquered yet, what are the, what are the things that you can attempt will make you feel almost like a child or useless, even after so many years of, you know, doing French. I can tell you that, you know, the, the story that I narrated about, you know, CIOs in America, made me feel that. It was a reset, because, you know, in the world where we were popular, in the restaurant space, the geographies where we were popular, we were already popular. Nobody was telling us anything. And then we went and hit a hard reset, Introduce ourselves, saying, Ki, you know, we are there, and the guy is looking at me like, dude, why are you here? Why the fuck are you even existing? And I'm trying to say, Nini, you know, 10 years old, we exist, we do something. It was quite refreshing, because I had to change my vocab, I had to change my understanding of the game, I, have to, I had to change my pitch, I had to also realize that, okay, these people are looking for something else, same product, but they are thinking about it differently. Refresh me, reset my game. I have five years long game in front of me already laid out and I'm enjoying it. Otherwise, I will get burned out. Thank you. Hope that helps. It does. <clears throat> Boss, thank you so much for all that you've shared. It's definitely been, again, one of the most profound conversations I participated in again with you. Thank one you. too many sitting in the back. Please give him a huge round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Receive fully. Great. Receive fully, sir. Thank you.